And we're back with Ryan Barnett, a senior security engineer at Trustwave, the lead for mod security web application firewall projects and taskmaster of web hacking incident database and distributed web honeypots project. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, welcome, guys. Uh, it's very nice to have you on the show. Uh, you have a technical segment here, but just reading your bio and your background, uh, I wanted to kind of just throw a question at you, if that's cool. <laughs> sure. So what kind of stuff are you seeing out there for, for web hacking? I know that I've been, uh, I've been given a presentation and I found some stuff in our logs. It was interesting uh, from the anti-sec group and, you know, launching an automated scanner looking for default installs of like PHP my admin. So what are the kind of <laughs> things that you are, and you're laughing because you've probably seen that too, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, lots of that type of scanning. Looking for lots of default stuff, especially on that end. Yeah, yeah. Is that pretty common? I mean, what have you looked at any of the code behind the scanners that they're running? Um, somewhat, actually. You know, we have different guys on the Spider Labs team uh, that really helps out on the research side uh, to do all the malware stuff. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. So uh, are you amazed as I am as to how successful some of the like scanners they throw together are as to how many websites they actually pop? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, economies of scale, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, odds are you're going to find some out there that have those issues. Right, right, right. Yeah, like we was just looking at the Lisa Moon malware, and it was like at one time Google was indexing like 1.5 million pages that it was able to modify. Right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting from that perspective, uh, the Lisa Moon, I was just looking at that this week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back in 2008, there was the quote unquote mass SQL injection bots. Yep. Um, and, you know, everybody focuses on the attack vector, you know, the input, mm -hmm. and because of the scale. Uh, but really, it's a cross-site scripting attack, right? They just found kind of a novel way to get the code into the database to spit back out to end users. Right, right. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of surprising still the amount of scale uh, and sites that are you know, susceptible to that. It's mm. pretty sad state of affairs. <laughs> so you give a presentation, speaking of cross-site scripting, uh, called right. Cross-Site Scripting Street Fighting. <laughs> we like street fighting. Yeah. Kung fu fighting. Yes. 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 Why don't you tell us about uh, some of the techniques you talk about in there? Um, well, yeah, it was an interesting kind of topic. What we ended up doing was, um, you know, at Trustwave, we obviously have web app firewalls you know, in the portfolio. There's a commercial one, but then I, I head up the open source side, Mod Security. And we end up oftentimes getting called in, um, unfortunately, after sites are hacked. Yeah. You know, th then they can't really say, oh, that'll never happen to us, <laughs> and kind of rolling the dice. Um, so it's really about remediation for a lot of the users. Um, so, you know, going in there and figuring out how to kind of play whack-a-mole with these types of things until hopefully you can fix it in the code. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what this presentation really was, was it, it was kind of um, correlating, combining all the different types of techniques uh, for attackers that they're using, you know, to evade filters and get the cross-site scripting code into your site, uh, but then also defensively. You know, doing the different layers of trying to, you know, block this stuff and showing where these things work and where they don't and where the weak points are and really why you do need the whole security and layers. Um, so I've seen references to mod security and mod security 2. Uh -huh. Yes. What, what's the difference between the two? <laughs> um, it's it's a code based it, change. What is a 2 after it? Um, what is a two there's after a lot of different after advanced after features in mod security version 2. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we actually talked about a lot of these in the presentation, um, doing more advanced things like content injection, you know, so when the data is going back out to a client, um, we can actually modify that data or add our own, which in this case, oh, you can add in no, JavaScript. No way, really? Uh, yeah, and doing persistent collections as so well. hold on, hold on, uh, wait a minute, let's back up for a second. Yeah, yeah. So you can modify the responses going back to clients that come to your website? Yes. And basically put arbitrary JavaScript code inside that request. Um, yes, that's one thing so, that we uh, highlighted was to actually add that in. Uh, in this case, under the scope of um, one of the end techniques we kind of finally get to, <laughs> it's kind of a last stand, mm -hmm. is to um, use JavaScript where we can add it to the very, very beginning of the response going out to the client. So we can yep. actually prepend data yep. to ensure that ours runs first. Um, so you actually put in some reference calls to some different JavaScript files that you can host on your website, 
And ultimately, what's, what this does is it, it forces a JavaScript sandbox down to the browser. Right. So uh, you can then well, essentially see, take I, the rest of that DOM and right. kind of freeze it. You actually use plain text and just turn it all to text. And then you, you know, use this parser to go through client side to kind of sanitize it and, and recreate the DOM. Nice. That's yeah, I great. See, I was thinking of it differently. I was thinking that everyone that could browse my website, I just hooked them with beef. <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a different use case. Because <laughs> Paul, so completely possible, just different use case. A different use case. Exactly. John, John, I know you're sitting in the back laughing about that. <laughs> Johnny, there. John, He's drunk. Sorry, I had mute on while I was laughing. Oh no, that's oh. fine. That's totally fine. So John and I give a course about a, a offensive countermeasures, and one of the things we talk about is building these kind of honeypots into your site and then hooking people's browser with beef. <laughs> nice. So, sorry, uh, so what, what are some of the other things that are in the, uh, the, the cross-site scripting street fighting? Um, well, you know, kind of walking step-by-step step mm -hmm. of what people normally think to do. Um, you know, in this case, really kind of setting the table for what we're outlining. And the issue is when you're talking about cross-site scripting, of course you need a, a multi-pronged approach, meaning, yes, go into the code, get with the developers, figure out you know, where that user supplied data you know, is echoed back out to clients, and figure out the right contextual encoding, all of the typical in-the-code developer stuff. What we're showing is more of a, a tactical response mm -hmm. because doing that type of stuff for most organizations is not a fast process. So, you know, there's a time lag. Meanwhile, you know that you're vulnerable right there. So um, if you're taking a web app firewall or external type of security approach, the first thing that everybody goes to is, okay, let's do some input filtering. You know, look for the obvious bad stuff coming in. Um, so uh, the way that we gathered a lot of this data and what we show actually in the presentation was um, we put out on the modsecurity.org website, we actually have a live demo page. So if you go to the main modsecurity.org, there's a little button on the right. It says demo. Um, and then you can go and it's, it's just a real easy form submittal. But you can submit code and then we'll tell you what we saw, if we saw an attack or if we didn't. And then there's links to like a bug tracking so people can tell us if there was evasions. So that's how we gathered a lot of this data. And the, the first thing that people you know, would go to is if you knew you had a cross-site scripting problem on a specific page is say, OK, let's do kind of a virtual patch. So we can use mod security to create a rule that says, okay, on this resource for this particular parameter, what is the expected kind of format of that payload, right? Certain characters, certain length, things like that. If you can enforce a, a positive security model, that's preferred. Um, but for a lot of the websites that we see, that's easier said than done. Uh, a lot of times it's because um, they're not really sure what the payloads are coming in or the, you know, there's just too much variance. They can't really so, lock it down because there's I'm certain sorry, characters Ryan, that the, need to be there. Right. The, um, um, a good example is just like uh, freeform text fields, right? Comment fields. You can't <laughs> can't really restrict that down. Um, so then you can go the whole black blacklisting, you know, negative security approach. Look for bad characters and things like that. Um, but you know that's not all inclusive either. Uh, there's always the evasion issues, right? Because you're they'll figure out some new way to get around what you were looking for. Um, so the whole input filtering. Yes, you should do it. You know, if it's something obviously bad and you can filter it, great. Mm -hmm. But there's still going to be the, you know, those categories of things that make it through. So that's not enough. Um, some of the other interesting things that we were working on to kind of combat that when we were identifying some of the, uh, the real uh, kind of prolific guys that were evading our filters. And there's a, a good reference actually in the, the PowerPoint in the, in the notes. Um, there's a book out, came out in the past, uh, I think it was right before the end of the year, Web Application, uh, what is it, uh, Obfuscation. Uh, there's a bunch of guys there that wrote the book, and it, it's really good, and they figured out some really, really clever ways using JavaScript to get around these filters, and it's still executable code mm -hmm. in the browser. Um, so there's some other more generic rules that you can put in place, because looking at these uh, real advanced payloads, you know, as they're coming in, in order to get around the filters, they have to use a lot of tricky techniques, you know, to, to evade that. But by creating this payload and morphing it in such a way, it has certain characteristics. So there's kind of some heuristical <laughs> kinds of analysis you can do to say, hey, this just doesn't look the same as a normal payload. You know, too many meta characters, the size is crazy. There's certain ratios of word characters to non-word characters. 
So there's some pretty cool things uh, that we added in. Um, we actually did a port. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the PHP IDS program or project. Um, some of the guys there were they are the ones who actually wrote the book that I just referenced. Um, and they have a really cool way to look at some of these things to do that kind of heuristical, you know, anomaly scoring kinds of things. So we actually ported that to mod security. And back to one of your earlier questions about differences between older mod security and mod security two, uh, we also have a Lua API. Uh, we kind of took a note from Nmap, you know, and how popular that was just to kind of expose the capability saying, hey, if we don't have the logic you want, write your own. Um, so we actually made a port of this uh, PHP um, normalization code. Uh, so that really helped us to identify a lot of these evasions that they were using, you know, to evade the filters, different encodings and things like that. Yeah, I think you're, nice. it, it's absolutely the right path and you're kind of borrowing from a lot of the defenses that we've been talking about and that if a system is doing something that's outside of the norm, right. probably bad, right? And like you said, <laughs> yep. No, you know, regular payloads, as you call them, which are, you know, I'm assuming that regular requests have a profile. And when an attacker launches some kind of attack, it falls outside of that profile. And you know, yep. we've been relying on signatures for so long, and that's kind of dead in the water. But I think looking at how malicious attacks are just different, and it, yep. you know, it doesn't matter how they're different, but they're different from regular, <laughs> from regular payloads. I think that's great. Yeah. So, you know, taking the next step, you know, in this street fight, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's kind of going back and forth, right? They, they have an attack, we figure out how to counter it, they figure right. out an evasion. So it, even doing all of those things that we just discussed, there were still some advanced payloads that were making it through. Um, there's some real interesting references if you want to check them out. It's uh, HTML5sec.org. Mm -hmm. uh, um, using lots of these more advanced features in the browsers for HTML5. So there's a whole new like, category of, of ways to um, pop JavaScript, essentially, using kind of really strange, fragmented combinations of things. Mm -hmm. So I finally kind of threw up my hands <laughs> and said, look, doing the input filtering kinds of things, it's good, you should do it, but don't think it's 100% you know, you're going to block everything. And I said, we need to kind of change our perspective here specifically for combating cross-site scripting because it's not really the inbound to the web app that's the problem, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not a target against the web app, you know, code interpreter. It's getting back to the client browser that's the problem. So I said, all right, we've done it kind of as much as we can on the inbound. Let's reverse things and kind of say, all right, let's just focus on the data leaving the web application. Um, what can we do, right, to, to kind of look at this and figure out um, you know, if there's weird things going on, like you were saying, things that aren't normal. Mm -hmm. So one thing we were looking at is it, it's the idea of getting to the underlying vulnerability uh, of cross-site scripting rather than an, an attack payload coming in. Right. And that is the idea that this user supplied data comes inbound and in the scope of a reflected cross-site scripting, you know, the response coming out, if you compare what the client sent inbound with different fragments of data coming outbound in the response, if you can see that there's some matches there, that's telling you number one, okay, client data is being echoed. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at it and say, okay, is the application doing what it's supposed to do, right? And figure out the right type of cool. encoding and escaping. And if it's not, it's more of like an application defect identification. So it was really interesting when we started like field testing this uh, with end users to say, look, this isn't, this isn't a rule you're gonna put in place necessarily that's gonna catch bad guys trying to pop your site. It's if you have legitimate users using your app the way it's supposed to, but what this rule can do is it can identify those areas in your web app that you need to go back and fix, right? You can figure out these URLs that aren't properly output encoding and say, look, you need to fix this page. Um, so it's an interesting way to, again, focus away from attacks and try and get to the vulnerability perspective. Yeah. John? So what are you guys, I mean, I hear a lot of talk in the industry these days about cross-site scripting. Um, Cross-site scripting isn't what keeps me awake at night. What keeps me awake at night is first clowns. And <laughs> the second thing that keeps me awake is cross-site request forgery. And I think that that's a much more difficult problem to solve. So what do, you, what do you see in the industry as far as making advances to try and stop cross-site request forgery? Um, well, two different things that you know, we have done on the mod security side. One is kind of borrowing a page from an OWASP project for a CSERF guard. Um, you know, the older version of that is using, um, you know, JavaScript insertion, essentially, 
to get into the DOM, you know, and then figure out form fields and links and things like that, and then adding in a request validation token. So we do have a version of rules that we have on our OWASP project that does that. Um, we were trying to figure out a, a little better approach there than using JavaScript because, you know, there's some issues getting client side to have that work correctly. So one of the things we're looking at right now is um, we've actually extended the capability of modifying response bodies. You know, for a while now, we've had the capability to do that prepend or append. And in this case, you know, you just tag some JavaScript on there. Um, but now in mod security version 2.6, which actually it's still a trunk version, it's not release quality yet. Um, we've implemented some different capabilities so you can actually modify the entire response stream. Uh, so we have a different operator where you can do like regex matching and substitution. And we're actually just yesterday, we were testing out trying to do that to add in request validation tokens to forms. You know, doing it server side, so by the time it gets to the client, the tokens are already there. Protections that you're putting in, you're putting in on people's servers as far as what is being sent from that server, correct? I'm, I'm sorry? So a lot of the protections that you're talking about are basically protections that people can put on their servers to make sure that they're not uh, basically a site that is actually launching cross-site request forgery attacks, like blog websites or any type of post website like that. Uh, yeah, for, for this use case, right. Or it's if the CSERF code is piggybacking on cross-site scripting you have on your site, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if some if one of your end users is on the site that's using those tokens, but then they're you know multi-tab browsing, they go to another site that injects that CSERF code and come back to your site, um, you know, it should block that, right? Because they shouldn't have access to that token. So their request should either be missing a token completely, or it shouldn't have a valid token. Uh, so it should be able to block that. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're still testing that out. <laughs> it, it, it's working fine on regular form fields, but we still need to be able to parse and update regular links. And Ajax is the other thing we got to tackle because <laughs> that's a whole other category of, you know, launching those requests. And there's not a, a great standard way uh, of them defining those uh, Ajax calls, so it's a little trickier. So do you almost feel like trying to hit the moving target? Like, you know, people are just now trying to get grips with cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery. And now it's like Ajax and HTML5. It almost seems like a lot of these issues with these new technologies are coming faster than we can actually secure the old technology. Yes, <laughs> I agree. And, you know, obviously from my background, uh, as you were saying at the beginning, I'm more of an operational security guy. Um, so I realize that, you know, developers and secure coding and all those initiatives, you need to do them. But what you just said is another reason why you have to have something in operations, you know, monitoring your network live, just to kind of be a little bit more agile. Not that it's this whole silver bullet or silver shield in this case, but uh, yeah, I mean, you got to have something, some sort of tool that you can monitor your traffic and as these crazy things are happening, you know, try and put something in place. So Ryan, what's yeah. the deal with HTML5? So many people ask me that. They're like, oh, Flash, it's not on the i devices, not on the iPhone or the iPad and... You know, is it really less secure? And what about HTML5? What's your, what's your thoughts on the matter? Um, I mean, I haven't dug into it in depth, like a lot of other uh, folks, yeah. you know, that I've been referencing some of their work. Um, it, it's just, you know, anytime you're adding in those features to make it, you know, feature rich and to do all the cool media stuff. I mean, when you think about the issues that we've been having recently with, you know, more flash, you know, and some binary content, those kinds of things. I think that category is only going to get worse. And I will say that that's an area that from security monitoring solutions, whatever they may be, you're going to have to be able to dig in deeper to different types of protocols like that to be able to figure out if malicious things are happening. Yeah, and for a long time, like you mentioned, you know, talk about Flash. For a long time, we were lacking adequate tools to decompile Flash to figure out what was going on. Right. <laughs> Ryan, was there, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about with respects to your presentation or mod security? Um, maybe just uh, two, two different points. Um, one was one other kind of technique uh, that we were using, again, not specifically looking for cross-site scripting, but it, it's kind of a, a correlation, is if you're able to monitor response bodies going out, you know, from your, your website to, you know, regular web pages, HTML, text, 
you can actually track like the number of iframes, scripts, and things like that that are legitimately in the page. And then all you have to do is alert and or block or modify when those things change. You know, so if somebody's able to actually get by some of your you know input validation, make it into the app and then come out, and all of a sudden there's a new script tag, you know, you can actually take action upon that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final thing I would say is in higher level, just about mod security. Um, some recent news that we had was about, I don't know, two weeks ago. Uh, we actually updated the licensing. So we actually changed it from GPLv2 to Apache Software License v2. And part of that was a change to really get um, more community involvement. Specifically, we've been talking to a lot of vendors that would like to take mod security, maybe port it or modify it, and then roll it into different solutions. Um, so that's going to help. And you know, we're trying to get a lot more people on board in the community with helping with development. Um, so we're hoping that's going to pan out. Nice, nice. Yeah. I, I've always heard that everyone really likes mod security when they it, when it comes up in the discussion of a web application firewall. So Hell yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. And then people ask, "Is there a nice GUI for that?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that's one of the issues. It's you know, it's a lot of times people compare it. It's like Snort, but for web. Mm. You know, that's that's our yep. specialty. But anybody who likes getting their hands you know dirty and, and technical with trying to figure out how to write these rules, love it. Um, but really, I think mod security in and of itself, it's not really right to compare it to commercial WAF solutions for exactly what you just said. I mean, I, really, it, it's a web app firewall engine, right? It, it right. gives you the capability and scripting mm-hmm. language to do all that stuff, but it doesn't have a, a built-in GUI. There's no reporting. <laughs> there, there's, there are some community efforts that help, and, you know, they're free, <laughs> but they're not really up to par with some of the other commercial solutions. But um, for those people that need something quick, you know, you can plug it in for free. And if you have people that want to dive in and get their hands dirty, write your rules, they love it. So yeah. it's but a lot you know, of fun to play around with. And I love it just from the research perspective. Yeah. And that's why I think it's great. You know, in Spider Labs, they kind of let us run wild and say, hey, whatever you want to do. Um, so we're having fun. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. John, you had John? Something? Was, Did you have yeah, something to say? That's one of my fears with, um, with products like these, whenever people basically freak out because there's not a GUI. Um, it just kind of shows that you don't understand some of the core technical concepts. And I think as long as you don't understand those core technical concepts, it makes it very hard to secure those products, those devices that are actually traversing across your network. Um, yeah. So sometimes we go with what's expedient and easy for the sake of bypassing understanding, which is really the ultimate goal of security. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Ryan, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, Thanks for having me. Presenting this information, it was uh, it was great fun. Everyone should go check out Mod Security. I think is what we all learned here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, Ryan. All right. See you guys. Have a good night. And with that, we will take a medium a break at a medium pace is really what we're trying to say. Yeah. And come back and talk about the stories for this week. Where's the shampoo?